Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans, by wrestling fans, on the web today. I'm John, that's my cohort in commentary, Ashton. We are still the Puitov Tag Team Champions, and this is our Monday Night Raw Review. So guys, the best way I could personally articulate this Raw it was a Raw that I wasn't entirely engaged with for the whole three hours, but that's not meant to be a discredit because so much happened. We got four returns, we got storyline progression, and we even got two, in my mind, big matches for Battleground coming up, which floors me. So in terms of development and progression towards, uh, you know, I guess SummerSlam, so to speak, because that's what we're on the road to, this was exceptional. Ashton, what do you think? To me, this episode of Raw felt a lot like a poor man's version of the post-WrestleMania Raw. It felt like they were trying to pack all kinds of stuff into this one show. And I honestly think that it's because they're trying to really get a good number for SummerSlam. So they're really like, they're starting early, man. They're like, we need to, we need to get people interested in the product because we know that we're going to have Brock Lesnar for SummerSlam. We're going to have all kinds of these different storylines going into SummerSlam that we need to start building up now and get kicked off at Battleground. So I think that they really packed this show full of surprises and, and good news and maybe a little bad news. Win, 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 wink. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a really, really loaded Raw, but I, I understand what you're saying when you say that you weren't fully engaged, but I personally found this to be one of the best Raws that we've had probably since, I would say, April. I would agree with that. I would absolutely agree with that. I just think that there were points where I was kind of in a lull. So, so really, I think the, um, the problem is more on me than on the product, to be honest, because, again, they, they packed a punch last night. Uh, so with that said, let us get right into our first segment, Heat of the Night. And you know what? This Raw came close on only one occasion to getting a Heat of the Night for me, but they handled the situation in the aftermath so brilliantly that it turned into a positive for me. So I've got no Heat of the Night tonight. I do have one Heat of the Night. Okay, let's discuss it. Okay, so... Normally, my heats of the night are because I had a legitimate problem with something that I just flat out didn't like it. But in this case, it's less of an I didn't like it because I actually did like this. But the, the heat of the night that I have tonight is more on the lines of uh, something that doesn't make sense. Why, in Triple H's right mind, would he include Roman Reigns in the Fatal 4-Way when literally, like two weeks ago, he was doing everything in his power to prevent Reigns from even having the opportunity to qualify for the WWE Championship Money in the Bank ladder match. You know, I was curious who was going to draw the gun first, referring to the people who um, who had the exact same criticism, because I did plan on bringing this up during the opening segment, but it seems that you share in that criticism, so we're having it out here, which I like. I had the same problem when I really digested it and I actually read the arguments for myself, because I'm like, ah, I never really pondered that, but here's the best defense that I could come up with. And not saying that I don't agree with you, but I always like to play devil's advocate in these, so here's the best defense I could come up with. Um, you know, John Cena right now I think is perceived as the new enemy because he's taking a stand for Daniel Bryan. He's taking a stand saying, you know, that I'm the champion, so Daniel Bryan will be guaranteed his rematch uh, as long as I am champion. So in that case, they look at Roman Reigns. Uh, and Roman Reigns just wants the championships. You know, he doesn't care who's standing in his way. Like you said, nobody's going to stop me now. So for the authority, they say, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So I don't think it's about Roman Reigns potentially becoming champion. So basically using... what your logic is, uh, public enemy number one has went from Daniel Bryan to The Shield to John Cena. And now because they care more about screwing John Cena, they're willing to go to even greater lengths, including calling on previous enemies just to try and screw Cena over. Exactly. They're viewing Roman Reigns not as an end in himself of potentially being champion and having to deal with that burden. They're looking at Roman Reigns as a means to the end of ending John Cena's championship reign because right. I honestly think that they have that security because of Seth Rollins being Mr. Money in the Bank. Right. So Roman Reigns is merely a tool, but he's going to comply because why wouldn't you comply when you're looking uh, at being within an eyelash of being the champion? Right. So. 
Okay, I, I understand now. I, I mean, still, it seems like a major plot hole, but I can kind of get along with what you're saying as far as your, your logic on this, so I'm going to just kind of drop it at that. I will say, I was incredibly close to having two heats of the night tonight, the second one being now all of a sudden John Cena is the locker room leader against the authority because, you know, that's not a spot that Daniel Bryan started in the first place. That was another criticism a lot of people had that I read, and to me... See, it's a shame that it goes to a guy like Cena because I get that Daniel Bryan is is out and you want to keep the momentum of the angle hot, so you want to transfer that momentum to somebody else. But why not a guy like Dolph who was exchanging great promos with Seth Rollins about being a backstabber? Oh, because you know, Dolph like, Ziggler isn't an A-plus player. Well, and, and, and there you friggin' go. So, you know, it's just uh, that criticism I have no defense for because I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And to be fair, I wholeheartedly agree with you on the first one. But again, that's the best defense I could come up with. Uh, it should have gone to a guy like Dolph or somebody that's been known to stand up to the authority but not be in as big a spot as John Cena. So right. that disappoints me, but it is what it is. Right. All right. Well, you know what, dude? I'm going to say this. For as many criticisms that I do have for tonight, and those were really the two big biggest ones, um... This Raw, not only did we have four returns, one of which was kind of lulzy, because really, how much does a great Kali return even count? But on top of that, we have already six, count them, six. After one show, we have six matches, most likely. Now, only one or two of these is actually confirmed. Actually, two of them is confirmed. But we have six potential matches that look absolutely amazing set up for Battleground. We have the Fatal 4-Way Main Event, Cena, Reigns, Kane, Orton. We have the Intercontinental Championship Battle Royal. We have Ambrose versus Rollins in whatever gimmick match they do. Or we could just end up seeing them in the Intercontinental Championship Battle Royal, kind of like what happened with the Money in the Bank briefcase ladder match. We have AJ versus Page in a rematch for the Divas t- Championship. We have Chris Jericho versus Bray Wyatt. And we have Jack Swagger versus Alexander Rusev. To me, in one night, the WWE has single-handedly made up for the fact that we only have a three-week time period between Money in the Bank and Battleground. There is so much I want to say on this, but there's a more appropriate segment to do it, so I'm just going to say that I completely agree with you, and we can move on. All right, dude. Let's get into our Monday Night Raw review. Oh, man, I love that. You should start doing the Raw intros more. You you really put your voice into it there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, for what it's worth, it is 1 o'clock in the afternoon since we were both pretty tired after Raw tonight and decided to sleep it off. Yeah, that is true. I mean, I do have more energy now than I normally do when we record Raw to it well. But, yeah, let's, let's get into it, man. It was a really fun show, so I'm really feeling it. We open things up with, as usual, the authority. They come out and... Uh, really typical authority stuff. Triple H talking about Rollins being the future of the WWE. Eventually they're talking and then Cena comes out and Cena comes out and he gets the mixed reaction. And before we even talk about the rest of this promo, can I just point out how much of a douchebag John Cena looks like with those freaking belts draped around his neck like he does? Yeah, Biker Undertaker made that look cool. You, uh, you don't. <laughs> So, yeah, that's immediately what came to mind. I'm like, that's what Biker Undertaker used to do when he was Undisputed Champion, and now Cena's doing it with the two belts, and I'm like, eh, with you, it's just obnoxious. Yeah. So, one thing that I didn't expect here was Stephanie actually went for a little bit of a, uh, a cheap pop here, because she talks about how she was actually born in the city of Hartford, and she gets a big pop for it, but... On that same note, she says, I know, I know, you must all feel so privileged. (laughs) So um, she does start talking about Daniel Bryan's recovery, uh, taking a little bit longer than they originally thought it would. Talks about Seth Rollins, John Cena, blah, blah, blah. So then Cena comes out with the belt straped over his neck like an idiot. And uh, right as Stephanie is about to talk even more, Cena cuts her off, brings up Daniel Bryan saying he'll be back better than ever. Cena says, even though the authority won't give Daniel Bryan a title shot, I will. And he starts a yes chant. So, again, going for the the cheapest of cheap pops in this case, basically pandering to the the, uh, the most popular guy in the company as it is right now. Uh, And then Stephanie reveals, but, John, you don't get it. We're not here to disparage you. We're here to congratulate you because you are the 15-time champion and you are the cover boy for WWE 2K15. And then they reveal it, and it's all, like, explosions and confetti and corniness. I just, I I want it so badly for the wrestling conspiracy theorist in me to be like, it makes sense! 
this title win slash reign was just an elaborate ruse to, you know, publicize the new video game. This promotion is sickening, but, uh, but no, you know, 15-time champion cover 2K15. And, uh, of course, Cena questions the motives. I have to say for Cena, as much as I've been ragging on him as late, uh, lately, his facial expression in response to this was hilarious. Because he's just like, when's the other shoe going to drop? It's like he was just waiting for Stephanie to just pull the knife out and go for the stab right then and there. Dude, this he- freaking segment was hilarious because the whole time Cena was talking like he was a gangster again. And uh, Triple H even made a, a point about how, what's the matter, Cena? You dropping your Oz? And Cena's like, yeah, I'll drop my Oz and then I'll drop you. He's just, just hilarious. <laughs> like, when Cena wins championships, all of a sudden he returns to his Boston gangster accent. It's just hilarious every time. It's like, when I get fed, you all get fed. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it was nice to see that throwback from Cena, you know, doing the whole uh, Dr. Thugonomics-esque attitude. Because uh, I still like Cena when he's in that form. When he's serious and he's focused and he doesn't try and do the corny comedy, I can tolerate and even to a degree like Cena. It's only when he devolves into that just shameless pandering and the corny comedy that I just loathe him. Uh, so this was good stuff from Cena towards the end. And, uh, you know, I think at this point Triple H does talk about Cena's first defense because Cena just got a little bit too lippy for the authorities' liking. Says that Cena will have a fatal four-way at Battleground. Well, I mean, for uh, what it's worth, he lets Cena choose, which to me was just ridiculous because he said, look, John, we like you because you're an A-plus player, so your title reign, you can either have it the easy way or the hard way. And Cena says, well, I've always been one for a challenge. I'll take the hard way. And then freaking Triple H is just like, yeah, I expected no less from you. And frankly, I would have been kind of disappointed if you would have taken the easy way. And then he and Steph kind of glance, looks at each other. And then, yeah, he says, you're, you're defending your championship in a fatal four way at battleground. And two of the other three men in that match are going to be your opponents tonight. It's going to be you Kane, and of course, he can't just say Kane. He's got to be the Demon Kane, the Viper Randy Orton, and the fourth man in the Fatal 4-Way at Battleground, Roman Reigns. <laughs> what do you think of this main event, dude? Oh, dude, you, the uh... main event's amazing. The only problem that I had with it, I already addressed, because it doesn't make... Well, at least it didn't. I mean, you you kind of justified it. And I can kind of see where they're coming from there. But it still doesn't make sense that Triple H is trying so freaking hard to make sure Roman Reigns didn't win the title. And now all of a sudden it's okay as long as he takes it off of Cena and not vacant. So, yeah, I mean, not a really big fan of that plot hole, which I still do consider a plot hole, although your justification was quite eloquent. But, yeah, Roman Reigns, Kane, Randy Orton, John Cena, Fatal 4-Way, it's going to be a great match regardless. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm excited about this, and it definitely continues the, the plot thread that's mm-hmm. held a certain uniqueness for me. You know, is Kane going to help Orton again, or will this be the time that he goes into business for himself? You know, we're talking about the world championship. See, and what I don't care. understand is why yeah. every and you're not the only one, John, so I'm not even just singling you out. It just so happens that you brought it up here. Why does everyone right. keep on thinking that Kane's going to go into business for himself? To me, Kane needs to stay with the authority until Daniel Bryan gets back because he needs to be Daniel Bryan's first feud when he gets back. And, I mean, as far as Roman Reigns and Orton go, they're perfect opponents for each other, uh, even if it means being after SummerSlam because the whole rumor is Reigns versus Triple H at SummerSlam. Well, you know what? If, if Roman Reigns wins that, then Triple H is going to send his goon after him. It's not going to just be Triple H versus Roman Reigns all the time. Triple H only works the big shows. Now, granted... He did work two extra shows earlier this year, but they weren't solo. It was as a part of Evolution. Triple H by himself only works the big shows. The only other show that I could see him working this year other than SummerSlam is Survivor Series. I could see it being like a Triple H, Seth Rollins, Kane, Orton versus Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, I don't know, Cena and someone else. Some kind of like a a Survivor Series traditional match. But at the end of the day... I think that Roman Reigns and Randy Orton are going to be working in the future, not Kane and Orton. Although, that being said, I I can't really say for sure, because then what do Kane and Orton do at SummerSlam when Roman Reigns is taking up time with Triple H? So, yeah, it's kind of convoluted, but at the same time, it's one of those things where I just don't like the idea of constantly talking about Kane's going to turn, Kane's going to turn, Kane's going to turn on the authority, Kane's going to go in for business service. I just don't understand what the point of all that talk is. I guess for me, it's just an inclination that, you know, he is 
the, the, this monstrosity, so to speak, and it's only so long that a monster can keep an allegiance with somebody. Right, but I guess my thing is, I, I guess my thing is, at one point, Stephanie straight up said, I can't control Kane anymore. And then the following night, she controlled him. Like, I don't understand why why they were trying why people are trying to build up this illusion that Kane is this uncontrollable monster when it seems perfectly clear that Stephanie and the Authority control him. Yeah, and I I would agree. I I would certainly concede that. I just think it's I don't know. I think you're always just going to have that inclination, even if you really have no justifiable ground to have it when they're in environments where it's always uh, espoused as every person for themselves, right. like Money in the Bank was, like a Fatal Four Way match is. So in, in all likelihood. You're definitely right when you consider the greater narrative and the, and the greater storyline encompassing these matches. But because these matches by themselves are espoused as every man for himself, I'm going I'm to keep a close eye on Kane and, uh, and see if he doesn't try anything with Orton. Because to be fair, I think even if he did, the authority would still try and keep the peace because they see what an asset Kane is. And they probably wouldn't even mind him as champion because, you know, he represents them. As long right. as somebody is representing the authority, I honestly don't think they care who the champion is. Honestly, I think their ultimate preference, if they were to have one, Rollins. would be Seth Rollins. Yeah, exactly. So we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, yeah, definitely solid segment. I'm looking forward to this matchup. Absolutely. Well, you know what, dude, before we move on, I just want to throw this out there. Daniel Bryan has uh, this injury problem, and the rumor is, and I read this on Dirt Sheets, so hold, you know, take that for what you will. Um, Brian might end up needing to get a second surgery on his neck, which would put him out for another six months. And I say that because think about what pay-per-view is in six months, John. Would it be Royal Rumble? It would. So you think Royal Rumble return wins main events WrestleMania for the second year in a row? I, I, I think that if he does have to get the second surgery, that is the only option right now. I would well, enjoy I mean, the, the hilarious thing is I say that's the only option, but that's what I thought last year, too, and how'd that work out. So just goes to show you how good I am at predicting these things. True, true. But then again, dude, I think everybody and their grandmother had the same thought pattern you did because it was such a perfect story for his baby face character. And honestly, them doing it this year, potentially, even though so many people already after his performance last year say – Roman Reigns has it locked up. Roman Reigns has it locked up, which now, seeing how things have panned out, I'm not so convinced. I honestly. think Roman Reigns is going to be money in the bank next year. I, I That, to me, honestly, at this time, is more viable uh, because of Brian's injury. Because, see, WWE, you can't even say that when you make a plan for next week that that's going to be set in stone, despite the fact that there's right. not really much time separating this week and the next. Things constantly change, especially right. if the there's that little, get as many. Yeah. There's that little, that little trick they do called rewrites. Exactly, and to me, if Roman Reigns was a lockup for the Rumble, which he very well may have been, you know, they may have looked at Brian's injury and said, "Okay, guys, he got hurt at the worst possible time, but let's try and really capitalize on this. Let's turn it around. Let's make him an even bigger babyface than he was before. Let's give him that sympathetic win, kind of like Edge got when he came back, and so many others before him. And to me, it would be an even better time to do this story now because of his injury and the ambiguity of when he would even come back and the severity of it, because the next, no joke." So I would go that course this year, and you know what? I'm glad you pointed that out, Ashton, because if that is the route they take, I think that's one hell of a road to WrestleMania. Right. All right, so I'm glad we got that out of the way.